Hello, 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 hello. How are we doing? Can we all hear us out there? All right, folks, here we're at the bridge for happening inside Hadrian Newcastle, an amazing new venue that's been uh, commandeered by the lovely Method Radio for the last few years. First time that the bridge is operating directly out of here for the whole of the festival. We've got a few little pop-ups here and there. And like every year, we like to have a panel discussion. My name's Donald Jenkins. For those who don't know, I'm a, I'm a sometimes rapper, sometimes spoken word artist, and sometimes gobshite as well. Pardon my French here. Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that. I'm going to stop that from doing that. Anyway, um, today we're going to have a panel discussion like we do every year, um, and we're always trying to take an issue that uh, we need to grapple with. Hip-hop is uh, 51 years old now. Ooh. And, uh, you know, it's important to kind of unpick some of the issues that make the culture the thing that we love, the thing that we cherish so dearly. Last year, we had a really nice one. We had we looked at the issue of, like, uh, hip-hop as a positive ch culture for positive change and looked at that kind of movement around that. We had a variety of different artists, including Black Twang and one of our other panelists who's on uh, today's uh, discussion. And in the studio here, we've got a plethora of great um, acts, uh, artists, so I'm going to introduce in just one minute. But today's issue we're going to be exploring is, what is the name of my... My DJ from vinyl to digital, our DJ's hip hop's hidden heroes. And on the panel, we have here right in front of me those listening in rather than seeing in the flesh, we have a plethora of some of the most uh, prestigious and most legends of British hip hop culture here. Some of them DJs, some of them who are DJs or have DJed amongst a plethora of other skills. They're representing other elements of the culture. Some of them not DJs at all, but dependent or kind of coexisting alongside DJs and I think it's interesting to hear these different perspectives. So tune in for the next hour as we unpick that with these plethora of great great individuals and but anyway just to let you know so who we've actually got here in the studio I'm going to do a bit of introductions as an opportunity where I probably uh, you know come and give lots of nice compliments about the people here in this space. Uh, but just to make sure that we've actually got an audience out there, this isn't just me just literally darting into an echo chamber. Can I get a cheer from the people inside? <laughs> yes, okay. Yes, not just talking in the dead air here, but we've actually got human beings in here. And this is today about the connection to dig us deeper into the culture. So first of all, uh, we have uh, Nomsky inside the place. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Nice one. Yeah, we've got photographer DJ Larder, larger than life host, documentarian of the UK, UK hip hop and youth culture subculture. Normski Anderson first came to public attention as a member of London's hip hop scene in the 1980s and photographed fashion associated with the scene for magazines, including The Face and Vogue. He's also become a fashion designer using patterns associated with black, black African cultural heritage. Um, I first became aware of him, like many people, came my age, I'm 46, so I'm going to be honest here, yeah. um, aware of the Normski film presenting um, Dance Energy on uh, Def 2 on BBC 2 in the end of the 80s, early 90s, which was a Lou Hughes show, and a place which shone a light on UK and American hip-hop and the rave scene, and I discovered things like Gunshot, Farside, Alternate, which I am eternally grateful, Mr Normski, is photography on the theme of the black British experience has been exhibited at the Victorian Albert Museum in, in London, and generally photography is the thing that we now most associate with Norbsky is in terms of a documentarian of the scene and kind of making us capture those golden moments that have made the culture what it is today. He makes uh, regular guest appearances at bars and clubs across the UK and a radio show The Ride on Push FM. I think I'm sorry you played drums as well at the Diesel Awards in the early notice. Do you play drums? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sound man. Yeah. Turn me right up again. Um, yeah, I've played drums. I played drums before I yeah, got into yeah. photography. Yeah, so multifaceted, multifaceted. There's going to be plenty of chance for everyone to have a spruff on. I'm still like, uh, stroking your, your uh, ego here at this moment in time. Uh, he's a fancy dark a shade of white, captures images of the 1980s UK hip-hop scene, and most importantly, his book, for those who are in the room, you can buy it today. It's over there. It's an amazing compendium called Normski, the Man with the Golden Shutter, came out in 2023, and it's both a memoir and era photo album, cataloging candidates, shots and offering recollections each frame charts the journey through subculture genres and generations explain how we got to where we are now can we give a round of applause for Dobsky okay yes yes quite an intro yes 
Next up, we have the amazing ZTA Sarah Love. Uh, let's give a cheer for her, Sarah Love. Yes. <laughs> Who's represented for 25 years, represented hip hop culture, been labelled the UK's first lady of UK hop by hip hop, is a veteran club DJ, radio broadcaster, presenter, and performer, and journalist performing all over the world, sharing stages with DJ icons like Grandmaster Flash, J- uh, Jazzy Jeff, Mary J. Blige, Wu Tang Clan, and The Roots. She's helped set up and was resident of the seminal London hip hop night, Kung Fu, was headhunted by BBC radio to present one extra friday night hip-hop mix show and the weekend wake up show receiving global prestige as one of the few female specialists in worldwide broadcasting mtv europe appointed sarah their official and only female vj on mtv based network broadcasting over six countries world 60 countries worldwide interviewing stars for mtv the lick and nfl touchdown she hosts the show good look and DJ Takeover I toured as an MTV Sound Radio DJ and DJ at MTV Africa, which helped set up. Sarah is the only woman in the Mobile Awards history to be nominated Best DJ twice and the first to have a nationally broadcast UK hip hop show. Let's give her all the applause for love, Sarah Love! Okay, and further along here, yeah, nice to see them. Uh, yeah, where, where are you? There you are. <laughs> uh, this man who we are saw just earlier, well, last year at the uh, UK Hip Hop 50, 50 celebrations in London. Uh, nice to have here somebody who has supported the bridge at various occasions is DJ Specific. <laughs> Runs independent hip-hop label Beeline Recordings and the Cold Crush Radio Show and has been an active in hip-hop since 93. He's a first-generation b-boy, graffiti writer, DJ and producer. Specific star releasing hip-hop, cut and paste records, records uh, during the early noughties as a soul artist and one half of the influential UK hip-hop duo Specific and Project C, releasing several well-received EPs. Uh, Specific has pursued his own ambitions of running a label and uh, continued taking it on and took over um, Beeline Recordings back in 2000. And 12. Let's give a round of applause for DJ Specific. <laughs> Sat next to me, uh, for those not actually seeing that happen in the real world, but on the radio, uh, I have uh, Mojax DJ. He's a video presenter, project product specialist. Originally from the South Coast, uh, Mojax moved to Newcastle in the early 2000s and has made his name producing YouTube videos for BeatSource Tech, doing deep dives into new DJ tech, reviewing it and giving it some tips and tricks to the trade, which is going to be good because of some of the insight of the conversations we're going to be having uh, very shortly. Let's give a round of applause for Mojax! <laughs> And we can't leave this person. This person is a success, a success story of the bridge. Um, not that they, they needed the success or anything because they're amazing. They're all like it's Holly, Holly Flo Lightly, which is a name that should be familiar with anyone who's used to seeing an MC mash up the space, having released an EP with the uh, famous Sicker Records. And round for tearing up stages and shutting down sets, Holly's been carving a name for her since and she first picked up the mic. Not so much bridging the gap between male and female DJs has never seen the, the line in the first place. Holly will hold it down with best of them as she's proven countless times both on stage and the studio. Uh, Holly came up here for the very first bridge uh, back in 2017, I'm going to say, possibly, get me right if I'm not ever, uh, came up, um, booked up as one of the artists and fell in love with the Geordies and decided to become one. So let's give a round of applause for this honorary Geordie. Um, and he's performed at, like, I think, at the majority of the Bridge Festival events since then, and this is the second time they're on the panel. So, again, let's give a round of applause for Holly Flo Lightly! <laughs> so, just to give a little bit of an insight of what conversations that we're going to be having today in today's topic. The theme of this general festival overall is uh, lost art. You might have seen it on the Bridges programme and thought, oh, that looks nice, but you're not necessarily sure of what that actually means. So just going to un- like unpack that a little bit. When we talk about hip-hop, we talk about the various elements of hip-hop um, that make up that. And then let's not be lie about this. Sometimes certain elements get pushed more so than others. Okay, We're often made secondary to others. So, for instance, graffiti, which we've seen lots of evidence here at the Bridge today, for those tuning in, we've got lots of um, writers painting up in and around uh, the building that we're in now, something that's happened for the last few days and will continue for the rest of the weekend. But it's graffiti which often gets pushed aside by the more socially acceptable street art. Um, and those who like to go bombing, or they call them writers, as the famous graffiti documentary Star Wars once said, are often pushed to the background as a sort of the idea of writing actual letters is seen as kind of secondary. And that's something that this festival is kind of trying to correct this weekend by kind of giving uh, graffiti and the writing aspect of it its uh, due deserve. Um, and also DJs who were literally the founders of hip-hop, you know, literally from starting up Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash, all the things that we've heard so much hammered last year when we were uh, celebrating 50 years of hip-hop. 
often sometimes I feel maybe pushed a little bit into the background, not maybe not seen as visible. So when we ask the hip hop music today about what hip hop music today, our default thing is for many people is to think of rappers rather than DJs themselves or whatever. So today we ask, what's the name of my DJ from vinyl or digital or DJ's hip hop hidden heroes? That's what you're supposed to cheer, folks. Yeah. Okay, let's get into this anyway. So just going to like dive into people. Appreciate that everybody. Some people are dedicated DJs. Some are people who uh, maybe give a background on why you should be a DJ and the kit that you should be using. Um, others are, you know, it's part of their skill set and others depend on it. So we're just going to quickly go around. And bear in mind, we've got an hour and I've already spat for about 10 minutes. Um, um, it's really important that we give a bit more of a concise answer for this, but then we'll get a chance to like proper chew it out in some of the questions. But I just want to ask you a little bit about how you came into DJing, and if DJing just something that you do a little bit of, just like how you first stumbled on it, um, anything. I'm just going to go straight into Sarah, first of all. Um, and yeah, let's give it up for Sarah Love. Do I need to do... Okay, here I am. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, how I got into... DJing, um, I guess like the seed began with my at home. My parents had records. My parents used to have house parties, so they'd often be a part of the evening where you know some people would play records, kind of thing. So I noticed how you could control what people, if the party continued, um, by what records were played, kind of thing, and just like you know get people more hype, start playing records to send them home, sort of thing. But um, no, so I guess that's where the seed began. And then for some reason, I was just always interested in production and DJing. And that was, I was in, into, I was a bit of a nerd for that. I started working in a record shop called Deal Real, the original Deal Real Records in um, Soho in London. And um, there I taught myself to DJ. So when the uh, shop was quiet, I was just taking the records off the shelves and started um, teaching, teaching myself like that and I was just part, I became connected to the UK hip hop community so I was then suddenly part of this uh, world of inspiration from people like Shorty Blitz and uh, many cool characters and people like Black Twang around and then I started a party in London with um, school friends of mine called Kung Fu where I was a, a resident DJ so it was kind of on the road baptism of fire training but somehow um, that's like 25 years later, <laughs> but yeah, so it's, I've managed to, to keep it um, going and it's taken me all over the world, so I feel very privileged that I've been able to um, do a job that I enjoy and I'm able to bring a bit of joy to other people's lives too. Excellent. So just that whole idea of DIY culture, just calling it out, making things for yourself, making it happen and hey, it turned into a full-time job and you are where you are now. Okay, and we just go through to uh, Norbsky. I, I know DJ is just one of the many, many things that you have on your on your resume. But uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that aspect of your of your character? Yeah, um, similar to Sarah, really. Um, uh, being my family are Caribbean, we had music from the before I was born in the household, and I was born in the late sixties, mid sixties actually. I'll say late to give myself a little bit of a youth. <laughs> Early seventies is when I actually arrived. No, I was. <laughs> But um, when I was born, it was quite obvious that um, music was going to be a very big part of my life just because of the whole background of where I was coming from. But nobody in my in my particular household had a sound system or was um, very much a you know, DJ or anything, but everybody did have records and everyone had a gram. And that was when I first discovered what records did, which is they fell onto this turntable. And I was intrigued with the mechanics at first. When I first, this would be, you know, early 70s probably when I was about four or five. But um, the reason why I really got into actual DJing when it became a phenomenon, which would have been late 70s, early 80s, the idea of not just playing records, but playing with the records and doing stuff, was definitely when the hip-hop thing came, but also because I used to play drums, um, which was my chosen instrument from school. And um, I had two hobbies. One was drumming, and then a new hobby that was coming was uh, photography. And I believe that really, I really got into the, the, the DJ inside of playing vinyls and records around about the same time I got into photography where it was probably because I stopped playing drums in the band uh, and, and I became, my hobby as a photographer sort of became my career and the music then turned into the hobby. I was going to be a drummer in a band, you see, but the band didn't seem to want to be a band, they just wanted to play. So uh, that's how I really discovered the, the DJ thing as a sort of frustrated musician that still wanted to be in the band. And when you put a record on, you've got the whole band there. 
And being a drummer, my, ry- my rhythm and my ability you know, for rhythm was quite natural. So mixing, I found a little bit like, you know, chopping it up with the drumsticks. I, I found that exciting. <coughs> Excuse me, as soon as hip-hop really arrived, and, and I'd say with the um, advent of, say, Kiss 100, uh, the concept of mixtapes uh, that we were getting from America, and the idea of this Grandmaster Flash and these characters, which up until then had only been seen on movies, um, and then 84 happened, and I think we had Beat Street, and then we saw a film, and then we saw Wildstar, and we actually saw DJs scratching. As a young person, and to this day, you, you're pretty mind I mean, it's for them, but you, you, know, you just thought, this is incredible. And that was a whole new instrument. But before, that used to be the record player that used to put records on one by one, play the old reggae seven inches that my mum and dad had, and listen to reggae music all the time. But suddenly I was listening to all kinds of music, and then suddenly all kinds of music was getting stopped, started in this rhythm, and that was it. And so I kind of fell in love with it when hip-hop arrived, the actual concept of DJing. That then led me on to every other genre that's happened since and not because I'm a junglist or I'm into garage or you know hip hop but just because I like to play music yeah. and, and I think that's the thing about being a DJ yeah. is, is it's you're constantly sharing music with others Can I just pick up on that just sort of thinking about in terms of uh, I mentioned how I first have discovered you and I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room in terms of suddenly being on a national television program mm. and effectively being presenting music was there was there an element of like the idea of DJ as a curator in being on Dan Selinger and sort of exposing people to this stuff in a obviously kind of underground music, but in a quite a mainstream sort of format like television. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't really done any radio work before television, hmm. but I'd been in a band, and so we spent a lot of our pocket money and you know part time job money hiring studios out to do tracks which lasted for about 45 minutes. <laughs> we couldn't work out where to stop and start, so we just used to have jams all the time. Sometimes we did songs. But when I got the opportunity to work on television, which was because of me being a music photographer, which I became quite early on, because the photography was just going to happen, and hip-hop and the music scene was happening, and that's why I became a music photographer. But, um, yeah, there was, a, there was a massive connection for me with regards to the presenting music like a drummer so you're you know it's quite a scary job being in a band being the, the backbone because when you mess the beat up the whole band goes ah so you and you know you're kind of the one that's easy to blame because you can lose the rhythm and stuff or you can hit you know you can really take it out so uh yeah so i think that that was a very big part of my transition with regards to the whole aspect of you know music dj and being a TV presenter was is that you kind of, you take on, so what I was doing, so that people understand, I did a TV show for those who aren't here in the room, don't know me, I did a TV show in 1991, which was the first time we had contemporary music, dance music, as uh, under an umbrella on British TV. We'd had other shows before that, but this is the one that amalgamated all the different sounds. And um, I presented it. So when I was presenting it, I'd already been a music photographer working with rappers. I'd already gone to live gigs. I'd already gone to live gigs with musicians and photographed them. So as a TV presenter, I was kind of just really just kind of, you know, transferring this energy that I'd picked up from seeing how they performed. So I had a lot of swagger like hip-hop MCs do. Um, but I didn't realise when I was doing TV that I was going to be have a face for radio because actually that's what you do on TV when you present. Is you're really presenting whatever you've got, your content. Very lucky I had video. But we also had live bands, we also had news stories, etc., which then takes me into the world of radio as a radio broadcaster. Who, when we get to the point of what we're talking about now, it's an interesting thing because there's very little DJing in broadcasting, yeah. but there's a lot of broadcasting that incorporates a bit of the music. But then you might get to do a mix show, which is just a DJ. So there's an important area of the DJ, which I'm sure we will get onto. Uh, DJ specifics or getting back here yeah, a little bit, just a, a brief story of your journey into DJ. Yeah, for me it was um, the advent of hip hop really. And when I first became a b boy and started to hear the music that was coming across from the states, one of the things that really stuck out to me straight away was the scratching. And um, hearing scratching, which was something that was brand new, 
And to me, it just sounded like um, it was just wild. It was out there. It was something I'd never heard before. We've all heard music. We love music. I love records. But we couldn't understand where this sound was coming from. And I was very lucky. I I had a music teacher at school that um, when Malcolm McLaren's song came out, Buffalo Girls, he let us study that um, in school. And we studied what was going on with the record going backwards and forwards. Um, so we all had a go on his little turntable. And, um, yeah, that teacher, I've got, I got to thank him, actually, because he, he really gave us the opportunity to explore what was happening at the time, um, from pause button mixtapes to writing raps um, and learning how to scratch. And, <clears throat> yeah, for me, that was really the kickoff point. And I was literally studying everything that was coming directly afterwards. Jazzy Jeff, um, CJ Macintosh, there's lots of um, unsung heroes in in UK kind of mixing history. Um, and I was just so intrigued by how they were taking a record and making it their own. Mm-hmm. Like hip hop was, you could do hip hop from nothing. And that's what I liked about it. I mean, my parents didn't have to invest any money. I, you know, you, you go out on the street and you danced, you went out and you painted. Um, but with DJing and the idea of being able to make music and being self-sufficient, That was really what kicked it off for me. I was like, I can do this by myself. I can become my own band. So you were talking about being a drummer. You you can take the music, you can manipulate it, you can do that yourself, and you can present it in the way you wanted to present it. So yeah, that that was my kickoff point. And more tracks, uh, you you come from a a variety of different music scenes, but you're DJing for 30 years. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your, your entry? Got volume. Check, check. Oh, there we go, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, I'll keep it quick. I started DJing when I was 13, and that meant that I learned about DJing before I was old enough to go to parties, even to like under 18s nights and stuff. Really, you know, I was so I learned everything about DJing in the early days. The things that inspired me to DJ was the radio. It was so important, but also TV. And I think it's such a crying shame that we don't have music on television in the same way that we did then because dance energy shows like the word as well. Seeing all these really vital and exciting rave acts and hip hop acts and all other kind of music on TV for a young kid was such an inspiring thing. And I'll always remember, some of you might be old enough to remember, there used to be a puppet character who used to be on uh, like morning breakfast TV called Roland Rat. Yeah, yeah. Roland Rat. Rishi Sunak. Rat fund, <laughs> right? Became the Prime Minister, didn't he? <laughs> and his friend was Kevin the Gerbil. He had at one point, I think for like one series, he had a Saturday afternoon show on ITV. And on that show, one day, and I must have been like eight years old maybe, and I saw Derek B, rest in peace, hip-hop, UK royalty. And he was on there doing Bad Young Brother. That was the first time I'd seen rapping properly. On a stage, it was the first time I saw a pair of Technics and someone rocking a pair of Technics. I mean, they were obviously miming, but like, you know, that's the first time I ever saw that aspect of DJ culture. So for me, from the very beginning, it was the DJ and the MC. And that was an essential, intrinsic part of what hip hop was right from the beginning. And I wouldn't have had that if music hadn't had that visibility on television when I was a kid. That's what got me into it. And so, yeah, there you go. That's rolling rap. <laughs> So uh, I'm just going to move the question on a little bit so we can also include uh, Holly a bit in this discussion and stuff. So like early hip hop, uh, DJs were very much front and centre. You had rappers and DJ producer combos, Jazzy Jeff, the Fresh Prince, Pete Rock and CL Smooth Gangstar. It was an era at particularly the end of the 90s and noughties of like lots of turntablists, um, next generation becoming very, very much front and centre. But I felt like that once we got into the noughties, particularly in the UK here, we came with the onset of grime. We started to see um, the scene become very MC led um, in the now in the UK. Outside of hip hop, there were a variety of other scenes that kind of mirrored what was going on with grime. So in the northwest, we have Scouse House or Bounce Music in the north up here in Newcastle. Uh, we have something that's called Makina, for those unfamiliar with it, is the Spanish hardcore form. Um, and, like, you know, people can stigger about it, but it's it's an intrinsic part of, like, Jordi and Tain and Weir culture. And then often what happens is that in this sort of genres of music is that, like, the music almost becomes like a backing track. Um, and the MCs maybe don't shut up at all. 
um, for good and for bad. You know, there's like there's definitely thing about it. But um, within all of that kind of stuff, does it beg the question of like what the role of the DJ is, and has DJ become secondary? Has it become a lost art form? And I thought, what a better way to do than we'll ask the MC first who's on the panel <laughs> what their thought is on that. Uh, well, uh, obviously, I'm modestly here as a as a rapper, but um, I absolutely do rely on DJs to play. Without the music and the DJ, I would simply be a poet. And as the majority of people in here, I'm sure, know that rap stands for rhythm and poetry. We need the rhythm aspect. So, um, I mean, I have, in certain scenes, you can notice that maybe some MCs, it's all kind of about the MCs and stuff like that. But when the MC really uses the DJ... You know, with cuts and fades, it can really um, uh, provide much more uh, focus on like the prosody, which is like how the, the lyrics are providing a, an additional percussive element. So I think when those two elements work together, it can provide a much more punchy performance and um, make the lyrics sound better and uh, for it to be a better performance. So in short, yeah, very important. So going for you, particularly, obviously, uh, I'll recently been at a gig which you you were involved with and stuff like that you know and, and because of the, the the nature of that gig it was easy for you just to rock up with a, a laptop chuck a memory stick in like lots of mcs do i know i do it myself sometimes and it's like what are you bring it tonight i'm bringing a memory stick that's the sum total of my creative output and you know you've got everything on there you've got your beat whatever but obviously that's an element what what extra does it bring for you to your live experience holly and how you present your music to an audience when you do have a dj present what's what what what's better about it? Uh, well, I mean, firstly, like bouncing off the other person, like you know, it's it's so great from the audience's perspective seeing people who are really passionate about the music and really enjoy themselves. When when the DJ and the MC clearly have a good relationship and everyone's having fun and enjoying the music, that that adds to it. Um, in addition to, as I was saying before, the technicals of like fading in and out and um, you know, like pulling up, doing a rewind, um, and. Uh, yeah, it just makes makes the whole thing a lot better, I think. Yeah. I go over to Sarah, you know, I've seen um you know, I've heard shows you've done before and understand obviously you do give a platform to, to rappers and stuff like that. You you know, uh, you know, definitely there's little like videos of you being with some of you know the kind of big names of UK Hip, Sonny Jim, um, people like that kind of spitting bars over for endlessly and endlessly over your music and stuff like that. Is there ever a time where you feel like you're kind of getting pushed back a little bit and you're not kind of given the, the sort of attention you do? Is it all just about them or do you do you feel included in that, in that aspect? It's not something that has ever crossed my mind. Like I think I'm just completely focused on on what I'm doing, and I think it is a marriage. We're all part of this one big happy family <laughs> in, in hip hop. But um, I think like picking up on something you were saying, um, I just think over the last couple decades, uh, you just it's become very solo artist centric. Like not just in in hip hop, not just in the UK scene, like just globally. Look at anything. I mean, how many groups can you name? Like, how many groups can you, can you name at the moment? Like, there, there aren't any. And I think, yeah, definitely that unique energy that you get when you have a group of people together vibing off in each other, sparring with each other, kicking each other up the arse, that's when you're going to get really exciting things happening. So I think, um, yeah, when you have uh, that beautiful relationship between the MC and, and the DJ, like, great things can, can happen. I mean, you just look at Run DMC, the impression that they have made on on popular music and then to people like Guru and Pamira's um, Gangster. I think, you know, they're also some of the pillars in, you know, what we think of in, like, the uh, foundations of, of hip-hop, uh, hip-hop culture. So I think um, it sh we should see each other as, as a family. But I think also now you have a lot of artists where that's not a thing that they're connected to. That's not how they've experienced getting into into music or what they see. I think also in terms, uh, we don't see a lot of examples of musicianship in, in music nowadays as well. Like, I mean, in the past, you could see someone playing a guitar. You could see like Jam Master J on, on uh, TV or something. Like we don't see those um, examples now. It's all quite, I think, egocentric, introverted, like uh, solo artist type uh, thing that we're, we're seeing, I guess, as platforms have changed now that we're in a social media solo 
has some German Nice, industry. nice segue into my next question there. Thank you very much there. So just like going back here. Yeah, so when I was 15, 16, and I was listening to mixtapes from like Ron G, Doo-Wop, Evil D, Westwood on radio, I would often go out and make, make they would make me go out and buy 12 inches CDs. I would need to know what it was that I was listening to. So in the age of influencers, the term that gets used probably way too much, streaming services, they make suggestions on what you play in X and DJs. Um, are DJs still important in shaping what music's important and what should we be listening to? I'm going to start with you. Yeah, absolutely. I've always thought that uh, if you cast your mind back to the 90s when you had a handful of TV shows, uh, radio shows and influential people that were delivering you the music and record shops as well, which were uh, basically a, a, a hub for people to go to find out what the latest music was, where the latest, where the shows are, you know, who's coming to town, all that stuff created a community. And the tastemakers back then, you know, t your Tim Westwoods and the other people, you know, Normski on the television, they were telling us what the latest music was and what we should be listening to. So nowadays, I feel that this it's so diluted that everybody's running off in different directions. And back then, I'm not saying it's any better, but we kind of had a better community with a similar mindset rather than lots of sporadic people doing different things at different places. Mm. You want to comment on this? Yeah, I was just going to jump in. Um, I think that it all went tits up when the internet took over because, you know, you're going to come back to, you bring in the word, uh, saturation. When uh, we go back to me, not sure what I was going to do in the hip-hop world, I had a hobby, and it was photography. So I had something that was a reason for me to look at everything. There's also, it just so happened to be the most visual scene ever to this day. A bar, I suppose, the crazy rock scene that looks visual as well, but it's, it's physical, create, you can't mess about with hip-hop. If you wanted to be a hip-hop DJ, you didn't just collect records. What you did is you had... You had two records. That's all you had. And you had one mic. And that guy on the decks could cut those two records and make about 50 different beats. So, you know, all this stuff. Not me doing beatbox. Actually, with the, you know, with the skills that Icky's got with the mixer or the ability to pull back and... You know? So, if you couldn't do that, you wouldn't go anywhere near the decks. So, I decided to be a photographer. <laughs> There's a lino right in front of us up here in the HQ here at the bridge. It's a, it's wooden, it's a fake wooden lino, which is an interesting thing to make it look like we've got a wooden floor. Yeah. Well, the lino our guys had looked like kitchen tiles back in the day, yeah. for some strange All reason. Cardboard. Kitchen <laughs> or cardboard. Or they did it on cardboard. Cardboard was the was was real thing. Um, and so if you couldn't really do anything on the line or on the floor or the cardboard, you didn't go on the floor. You're, you're definitely audience. Right now, I can do three tutorials in one week and I'm a producer, DJ, marketing person, just like that because of the internet. It doesn't mean I'm any good, though. Mm. That's the problem with the internet. We've got one million people that are not very good and no one's telling them they're not very good. <laughs> but you see, this is the, the, Some, the good no. thing about the internet is also the bad thing about it is that we don't have gatekeepers anymore. It's open to everyone but and their auntie, yeah. which is wonderful, isn't it? Because it's not like you've just got to be down with the, or allowed through by someone. Mm. But that's also the problem with it. It's open to everyone and their auntie, isn't it? I mean, you have someone like Soldier Boy who became massive. That tune of his, that was the first song he'd ever made. Like, there's no foundation there of, like, you know, cultivating a craft for him to, like, build on from that. I think also what we have now because of the digital era is you have a homogenized culture, not just in terms of hip-hop, but across the, the board. Like, I think to be part of hip-hop back in the day, you had to invest and earn your stripes oh, yeah. and prove that you were, like, prepared yeah. to, you know, be part of this thing and earn respect I think too, where like you say now, it's you know. It's not a bad thing the internet, no, but no. I do, I, but I do see that with when you you know like when you plant it's like it's quite hydroponic, where 
you know, it, you, you plant a seed on the internet and it's like, it's nearly dying as soon as you plant it. It's grown, it's gone around the world, it's, all the fruits have been picked up before it's even got fruits. Back in the day, the track came out over here, it got on the radio, a man's heard the track on the radio there, got to find the track. By the time they got in, in England, that's last year's tune in America. Now, that was last night's tune. Yeah. That's too quick. So disposable. Everything's too quick. Yeah. Just want to bring in Mojax here, someone who sort of uh, runs a, a channel which very much focuses on about the latest developments when within DJ technology and stuff like that. You know, go back this question again about like um, DJs as social influencers in terms of that. Do you, you know, do you still see that's important in terms of like modern music? And yeah, I think almost it's more important than ever because you know, I look at my kids; they're growing up now in the age of Spotify. They think music comes from Spotify, and they don't have to hunt for records. They can just, if they hear a record on TikTok or whatever, they can go and get it immediately on Spotify and listen to it. And these windows have gone so short, like you're saying, like well, the track gets around the world in no time at all. But there's so much music out there, so easily accessible. I feel like the DJ's purpose as a curator has become more important because you need someone with taste, with that vision and that foresight to sift through the millions of records that are released every year and help you surface the quality and the stuff that should be heard and should be listened to. So actually, I think we're on our way back to kind of the importance of the DJ being recognized again a little bit more. I think we've had this moment where it's just like noise, 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 noise. But now people are looking for something a little bit beyond that, and they want that curation aspect. And I think that's the aspect of DJing that's always kind of overlooked. It's not about your skills. It's not about how you can throw down your cuts. It's about curation and about bringing music to people's attention that you believe in and that you love. And I think that's still going on to this day, and it's very healthy, and I think it's getting stronger still, I think. So coming in that, we've talked about a topic here, which is uh, touched upon there, which I think we need to talk about, which is record shops. You know, are actually not allowed to go into a record shop. No one like made that rule other than me. Um, but you know, there was a point where I wasn't able to pay the bills or the rent or the mortgage or anything like that. So I'm actually kind of like it's an addiction that I, I actually can't I can't ban myself from it. We've got people in the room here who are actually called uh, the Vinyl Vandals, who are organisers of the the Bridge Festival, um, who are front and centre. And um, but yeah, just talking about record shops, we hear on year on that like record vinyl sales are getting better, they're going bigger. But I don't feel like that culture. Um, I don't see those because of obviously the closure of a lot of record shops. And I'm just wondering what, what do you think, uh, as we're heading into it, like vinyl sales going up, um, but it tends to be more your HMVs, does the culture of budding DJs hang around in DJ, hanging around in shops still exist? And if not, what does that mean for the culture? Uh, do you want to come in first? Yeah. Um, I don't think that exists, is the truth. Mm. I don't think it exists. I think it exists um, online. I think there's uh, a lot of groups on Facebook and various other social media platforms where people discuss, debate, look at the latest records and they create that similar community that you had back in those record shops. But I don't think that necessarily exists in 2024. I really wish it did. Um, there was nothing better than going into the record shop on a Saturday morning and um, looking around, see what other people are buying, see what <laughs> other people are picking up and just waiting and, you know, or finding out what, they, what they've hidden behind the counter. You know, yeah, because there's a lot of politics for them. Oh, there? Like, yeah, yeah. You know, proper Absolutely. gatekeepers like, oh, only yeah. give the records to certain people, well, but they won't let you yeah. all have. <laughs> but I yeah. think that was a really great thing. <laughs> you had to work your way to get to. You know, you're five man deep. Yeah. You're you're in, you're in line five at the moment. Yeah, it take you three weeks before you can get to line one and it's two. It's a bit like when I was growing up. I used to be on like the, the school bus. And it was only until you got into like sort of the latter years you were allowed to sit at the back at the sixth form. So you've kind yeah, of like got only stripes so. till you can get the back of the bus. Yeah. So, so um, uh, uh, talking about record shops and stuff, Polly, um, uh, is it a culture that you've ever been exposed to um, as probably the youngest member on the panel? Um, is like was vinyl culture at all, or would like did, did you have any experiences of going to record shops when you were younger at all? Um, CDs, CDs, not that yeah, cool, yeah. is it? Yeah. yeah. But did you ever did that. you ever do any performances in record shops or anything like that? Um, no, I didn't. But you know what? Listening to everyone talk now, I think it's definitely something that there needs to be a, a renaissance on. So maybe we can have a yeah. chat to. You. Are there any local? Record there are shops, shops, there's shops, but the thing is, the, the, there was a point where, you know, literally like being there a week and you'd have like a whole group of friends that you knew just from like uh, literally going around and setting records. So I mean, probably just pretty much answered the question. There you go, the youngest person, we don't go to how old or young you are. You, so you've come in at CDs, 
that you're a performing artist, MC, you really have missed out because this is the exact Absolutely. point we're talking about. Record shops, Dealville, Mr. Bongos, the rappers used to go in. In fact, you find what happens in record shops. Now I find in small boutique shops that have events when they have a launch and a magazine launch and a new range of dirty T-shirts with a few patches on them done by a new school designer who's upcycled some third-hand clothing. It's put it back out there. And it's quite expensive for stuff that's been worn 500 times before. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But the greatest thing about it is a couple of grime artists are going to get opportunity to drop their latest few tracks. And there's a little bit of a vibe there. Yeah. And, and that, was, that would be, you know, every single record shop I ever knew throughout the whole of the 90s and the 80s. In fact, even in the 80s, when I wasn't even into dance music, you could go to Honest John's in Camden, which is where I lived, and there was people in there smoking fags, drinking Guinness, going through the rock and roll section, a few people looking at the jazz. There was always a scene in record shops. It's a bit like a library, but you can hear things. You can't, you're not allowed to speak to other people. And, there's, and that is something that when I go to record shops now, it's people who have come in, special buyers, they've got a list of tracks, and the shop's quite empty. And there just doesn't seem to have that same community, which is at the very base of the hip hop elements, as it's a community based factor. Yeah, definitely. Record shops are very clinical nowadays, do you not yeah. find? Um, they really push their online stuff more than their but, stuff that's Yeah, going on very the much shop. so. We're back in the day, you saw sort of expensive. Very well. hands on. Everyone used to go and be chucking records about, you know, you never, no one was ever worried about finger marks on records back then. Can you'd I be just lucky just to get one. <laughs> you'd be lucky to get one. They only have managed to do five copies. You know, sale or return. Can That's I just how special music was. It still is special, but it's easier, like you say, more accessible. So the special maybe doesn't last as long. Just pushing a bit of a like a sort of honing question. I've always there's obviously spaces that we know that are male dominated, and I would definitely think of the record shop as being one of those spaces. And I heard like in an interview you did with Blade, you were talking about you know first discovering Mr. Bongos and stuff like that. And I just wanted to know like you know. The record shop, what's your what's your been experiences of record shops and obviously, you know, from going from where you were to, you know, what you've become as an artist to ever like how has that changed over time? Well, I'd definitely say the entire time, probably ninety nine percent of the time I've been the only woman there. So <laughs> um yeah, so I don't think it's just like a stereotype. I mean, the day when I discovered Dill Real in um Soho, it was a Saturday afternoon. Saturdays were always like the busy day of the week for record shops. That was also the beautiful thing in um, Soho because it was a real community of people. You just, there were all the familiar faces. There were obviously all the people who worked in the stores and everything, but you know, you were all part of this kind of thing, sort of comp competing against each other to like get the, the copies of that record before it ran. Um, ran out, but yeah, I mean, the day I walked into Deal Real, it was absolutely round of guys, and then I just pushed my way to the front and asked for a job, and then luckily I, um, I got lucky. But I think, um, yeah, that whole community, the amount of effort that you would have to put in to be a DJ back in the in the day, like trudging down to the West End, getting records, battling with the people in there, it was also also you just had spontaneous ciphers and things like that in in um, record shops, I mean, where I guess now it's something that's a more curated thing that, that um, happens, but there it was just, you know, part of the kind of grit of, of, of being in, involved in hip-hop. And I just feel so blessed that I was part of the last analog generation. Like, you know, it's just, I can't believe how lucky I, I got to be able to experience that, to learn as a DJ purely from vinyl, to have to carry crates, all of that. It's a complete different world to doing it now. So just honing on a little bit there in terms of obviously your experience of coming in this male dominated space to seeing sort of um, where we are now with DJs and that in terms of that, what's changed do you think for, for women going into DJ now? Is it easier? Is it harder? Is there still the same challenges? When I started teaching myself to DJ, I knew one other woman who, I'd heard of one other woman in the UK who DJed Miss um, Behaviour and she lived in New York. Then I met a second um, lady called DJ As If. She was the first woman who... Um, got into the um, DMCs in this country, which is a, a DJ um, competition that started back in the 80s. Um, but yeah, I mean, literally it was like the three of us, then I heard a DJ caper. You know, you could literally count the number of women that DJed within our kind of, of, of field and things. So that's completely different now, because I think, you know, people are often like, oh, how was it cutting through as a, a female? At the time, I just didn't think about it. I was like, 
I just want to kill it and I want to do the best set sort of thing. So, but um, yeah, now it's, you know, it's not even unusual to meet a female DJ. I think it's like, I told know, them it was going to happen. You know, and you warned them. I <laughs> said it years happen. and years ago because they undermined the, the, the females for a long time and then the girls are always there on the dance floor. A lot of people don't know that most of the record companies, well, the CEOs were always guys, but the, nearly everyone I ever worked with in every record company was a woman. They did the press, they did everything. They managed to the label, they did everything. Now I see, boy, if you ain't a woman, you ain't getting a DJ gig. <laughs> I've never seen so many women DJing, like, ridiculously. And, and actually, it's abs- that's one thing that's absolutely brilliant in with regards to Maybe the, the DJ's job or the way people see the DJ has completely changed because let's be honest, life evolves. Mm. You know, I was saying uh, uh, before when we were coming up to Sarah that I used to enjoy having finished a DJ gig in West End Soho. I used to have two aluminium boxes with 60 records in each one. And I used to enjoy carrying them, stop for a minute, get my breath, Come a bit further, put them at the bus stop and wait for a night bus. I had money in my pocket. I used to enjoy that in the rain, with no coat on. That was like, you know, I wasn't a scratch DJ or anything, but I was a selector. So I was curating the soundtrack for the night. And I like all that. And, you know, I look at it now and I think, wow, people might not be carrying all those records around, but hell, there's a lot more women out there making the dance floor dance. And, make, and guys now... They need to up their dancing game. Because yeah. guys have always been really good at standing in class. <laughs> with their arms crossed, watching everything go. And it always used to be guys staring at DJs, wanting to be the DJ. And the girls are staring at each other because the guys weren't staring at them, so they were dancing. But now the guys are staring at the girls DJing <laughs> and dancing. And guys need to up your game. You're getting lazy out here. <laughs> I was going to, um, like Sarah, I, funny enough, I used to buy records from As If. In dance too in Brighton. Like I used to go there every Saturday and buy records. There you go. I'm just interested. Like this whole thing of, like you and her got into this click into this whole record shop, very male dominated scene. Do you actually think that the internet has given more opportunities for female DJs to come through? Because you don't have to go through those doors and be as brave and as bold as you did back in the day to break into that click because now you can put yourself out there on Instagram, on YouTube, on socials, whatever. Do you think that's made a difference? Do you think that's one area where maybe the internet has made it better? Well, maybe all DJs and performers have benefited in that regard kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, um, because like I say, it's open to everyone and their auntie, isn't it? But I think, um, yeah, being um, a girl in that world at that time, yeah, you had to have some ovaries to like want to do that you know what I mean like, <laughs> like, I like you that. know I'm done, just yeah female empowerment we kill it man but um yeah I mean you had to definitely be brave to like want to pursue this and really be and I just think also as a woman you have to there's no room for error you know you're going to be judged at maybe it's a little bit different now but you're going to be judged at a, a different kind of standard I think so it's like if a woman makes a mistake doing something it's because it's a woman, like, why should you shouldn't have let her on the turntable sort of thing. So maybe some of that is a bit different. Now, I do also think you've got a kind of more of an era of, um, I'm going to be a DJ, I'm going to put videos online of me DJing in a bikini and, you know, like, getting hype, and then that's going to generate loads of hits. And as we know, it's all about clicks and views and everything now. So, you know, there's that aspect, I think, that uh, obviously has birthed itself that we didn't have before isn't it so more about the image as opposed to actually wanting to play the music possibly i think so and i think that maybe that's even guys are guilty of that now as well kind of thing i I just just think the general general online era it's about you know an image of something rather than like i want to be part of this world and i'm prepared to invest in that Mm. you know to get allowed in I think that's just the whole body image thing in general, isn't it, across the board? So just in an interview that, uh, Sarah, you did, and this is a question I'm going to ask everybody, it's an interview with Blade on uh, 0521. You said you were put on the spot to recite some lyrics from a hip-hop track. 
And your response is, I'm not going to make you do that, I promise you. Um, is, I'm not a crazy, you said, I'm not a crazy lyrical person. I was always interested in production and DJs. I never wanted to be interested in a rapper. I had no interest in that. So obviously today we're focusing on the lost art form of DJing. Um, and obviously there's been, in the, so far in the weekend, there's been lots of opportunity for MCs to shine. There'll be some rappers later on. But we want to focus on the DJing and that. So I, I want to just think about, like, you yourselves, and I'm going to ask you as the DJs in the room, and I'm also going to holler at Holly because Holly, I want to hear this. As somebody who has DJed or called himself a DJ in the life, myself being that, and, and someone who's done some rapping as well, I can think a bit, a little bit about when I listen to music and what I listen for. So, uh, and I'm kind of interested to hear what your interaction is. So when you hear a tune, um, what grabs you first? Is it the beat, the groove, or is it the lyrics? And I appreciate that that's not always going to be the same on every song, but if you're going to say, like, if you're going to have to weigh it in a certain direction, is it the bars, is it the lyrics, or is it the beat that is the thing that grabs you first? And Because you're the one who said it. I think it's probably fair that you speak first. Yeah. I would say no doubt it's the beat. Like, you can tolerate a whack rapper with poor lyrics, like, not even on any remote MC level if the beat is banging. You cannot tolerate, like, a weak beat with amazing, uh, you know, MC skills. Like, that's the bottom line. There's no even question about it for me kind of thing. Like, I think there's lots of great records where you've not even noticed how whack the, the rapping is on top of it because, you know, the beat is just hard. Yeah. Should we, yeah? Uh, can we, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll come back to you. We're just going to get... Am I wrong? I'm just going to, I'm going to agree with you because it's, for me, I always think about why did they put an instrumental out? Because the groove was so good. So, I, I think really and truthfully, because then I was thinking about when you get MCs, that just go out there and it's like jazz music where you can't you can't hear the beat but they're just on that thing that just rolls that thing makes you bring it in and you just feel the, where the rhythm is kind of thing without even hearing the beat but it's the beat in the rap that you're hearing yeah. rhymes and rhythm and poetry yeah. so the, the, the whole th if everything's sound, yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna go deep. Everything's sound. Sound transfers into music, into different audio tones. The first sound that any human being hears, and probably the last sound they ever hear, is the beat of the heart. I drop it there. Yeah, good point. Good point. Interesting though. I'm just gonna hope and Holly, uh, you got any any different spin on this at all? You know, it's been the rap. No, I, I completely agree with what everyone said. Um, I just I'm a sucker for a bass line, and yeah. uh, and I like the flow. I like the flow of the lyrics, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, I think the older I get, the more I'm bothered about lyrics come first for me, you know, but when I was younger, without a doubt, with a beat, I could listen to a tune about 20-odd times and never actually zone into what was being said, and then you'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, they're seeing this and that. Um, but, you know, as I get I think, older, I think... For me, I'm that's getting... the whole point, right? It's, it's not the lyrical content necessarily, it is the flow. It's how mm. the rapper is part of the music and flowing with the music underneath, and it all becomes one, like an instrument like a jazz thing, like that's, that's what the great MCs do, is they become part of that beat and part of that rhythm and it's all one thing. And, it, and at that point, yeah, so I, a lot of the records I love, I don't even know what the lyrics really are saying, but I know how it sounds sonically as one piece. And that includes the vocalist as well. So, and that goes for singing and rapping and everything. So yeah, I think that's, I, I, I'm always beats first, but yeah. yeah. Do you want to come in here specific? Yeah, I'm going to come in. I'm, again, I'm going to go against the grain a little bit. Yeah. I'm going to, because <laughs> years ago, absolutely all about the beat. For me, it was all yeah. about the drum breaks. Yeah, yeah. It was all about the scratching. It was all about the bass line and the samples that were used. That was, and the lyrics, what did they say? But more recently, I've got much more into listening into the lyrics yeah. in more detail. And... I'm not sure why. I'm not sure is why. It also, is it possibly because we're also in an era where, and I'm not going to disagree, but there's obviously a big question about lyrics in general and the fact we've got a lot of hip-hop that maybe doesn't even have necessarily like lyrics that we can actually zone in or hissing it because it's like mumble rap or any kind of rap where it's more the sort of the, the noise, the cadence of something without necessarily actually anything like sort of being concrete being said. Mm. Do the lyrics matter more now? or well, No, I, I think that if you just think about MC in the beat, and scratching as three separate entities. I think they all work individually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's been a big move in in recent years to non 
beats or, or beats that without drum beats in it. I don't know if you've heard that yeah, hip hop. Yeah. There's a lot of that, which is much more emphasis on the the loop and the vocal. Mm. And I actually could, I actually really like it. I really, I really like it. it. I mean, for me, it's um, it sort of moves away from our era where we're used to more of a dance floor friendly tune. Mm. But from a listening perspective, I really, really like it. So I'm going to say that. Um, all three to me are as important yeah. for me now. Historically, it would have been the beat and the scratching. Because I think it gets that L idea that about sometimes when you can go to a rap gig, particularly if you're hearing an artist for the first time and you're hearing it in the live, not at home, you might miss out on what some of the lyrics have been said. And a lot of these kind of stripped back, beatless kind of hip hop yeah. compositions, it makes you zone in a lot more yeah. to it, like as if you were like listening to a spoken word composition. I feel like yeah. you're going to say something there, yeah. Yeah, cool. uh, but I'm going to say I, I totally agree with Sarah. There's um, there is a lot of um, tracks that have got amazing beats, and the MCs are being carried by the beat, hundred percent. Cool. But no, I just wanted to say, like for this whole um, movement and era now, we have of beats that don't have any drums. Like I think that has its place, which is wicked if you're like zoning at home. I want to hear some hip hop uh, dance jump, floor yeah. records. Like yeah. I want the records that make us want to mosh out on the dance floor. I want us to like go crazy and just yeah. let loose sometimes when we're in the club. You can't do that with like with yeah. some of the, you know, cool. West Side Conway records, you know what I mean? which they have their place. But yeah. I just think we're not hearing enough hip hop party records right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to bring back agreed. hip house. Can we have a hip house moment again, please? <laughs> Let's bring that back. Yeah, Let's I think it's good. Yeah, so if it just we're getting into the kind of last throws of questions, and there's, there was some questions that were, were up in discussion, I think, when we first decided that this was going to be the topic one, and this is the one that everybody, uh, for the youngsters in the room, for the old farts like me in the room, whatever, this is the kind of question that kind of bombs down. So, in the endless memes of vinyl DJs taking the pay out of DJs with controllers, and memes with put and fun at vinyl-only DJ cliches, nights where people specify that we'll be playing all vinyl, we need to ask the question, digital versus vinyl, what's better in your opinion? And we'll go with the person just to the left of me who happens to spend their entire time actually encouraging people to go out and buy uh, bits of digital kit. So Both. It's <laughs> both. I play vinyl. I play 7-inch 45 sets all the time. I do loads of it. I also love digital stuff. Young DJs should not get into vinyl. It's incredibly expensive. Like, way more than it's ever been. It costs a fortune to buy records now. Don't do it. Like, wait until you're older, like you're middle age, you've got a bit of disposable income, then get a record collection. Uh, but until then, just play digital and enjoy sharing the music for what it is. It, the format doesn't matter. Different formats can be fun, but the format, the medium is not the message. At the end of the day, it's not, right? And that's the, that will forever remain true for me. So, yeah. And Holly is someone who's coming into this as sort of like you've just mentioned before that CDs were around you, but you, you know, you sometimes have experiences where you're spitting bars over people, mixing records. Sometimes DJing digitally, does it ever make any difference to you or it does it not bother you at all? <laughs> well, obviously vinyl is best. Yeah. Obviously, it's the, like, you know, the history of hip hop and where it comes from, so I'd say vinyl. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I like that what you said, because really and truthfully, I was uh, at an event last night at a gallery and um, all they actually had in the gallery, because it was the opening of the building and there wasn't actually an exhibition, slightly disappointing, but they did what you do at exhibition openings where they had a DJ. Um, it's a very nicely done gallery, and the DJ booth looks like your wooden floor, but it's actually real wood. <laughs> very nicely carved, like a carpenter did a good job in it. It had 12 tens on it. I was highly impressed. It was a strictly vinyl setup. This big, massive woofer, size of that thing you got there, <laughs> hitting the base out there, all the tops in the corner. It's really horrible room to try and sound. But I had to say, not even one bit of feedback like your mic off the vinyl because they had the wood, they had the stoppers, everything was balanced and it was a beauty to hear the sub bass in those records in the middle and the top. Had it been digital, I would have been in the smoking area and definitely outside more often because there is an MP3 kind of sound that does get to your ears, it's not comfortable and there's all this digital levels and all this digital stuff it's unnatural to us. So all day long, for the harmonies of the frequency, I'll take an a cappella voice or a bit of vinyl. <laughs> just like that. Oh, yeah. It's a room of all thoughts, obviously. Uh, all cheering for you. Anyone else want to come on this at all? I mean, I love records. That was part of why I, I fell in love with 
DJing, um, and you know, I'm I'm proud to have had calluses on my hands from carrying crates, literally, um, and the back injuries and things like that. But um, but ultimately, I think the most important thing, um, I think, yeah, the whole kind of all vinyl sets thing, like that's it's uh, like there's an element of sort of the beard stroking aspect to yeah. to it, but. I think um, it also Hips, has... It smells its, of hipsters, doesn't it, really, I think? It <laughs> does, but also nerds. Like, I love nerds. And there are people where it's like they are collectors. They want to go and, like, you know, admire other people's collection. Or they want to... They've spent all this time curating it. They might as well do something with it kind of thing. So I'm, I'm not mad at that either. But I think the most important thing um, for a DJ is rocking a party. And that's the bottom line. It doesn't matter if you're a technician. It doesn't matter if you can't... Um, blend a record let alone scratch it doesn't matter what genre you decide to play it doesn't matter what medium you, you you know format that you are playing with you've got to rock the party and that is all that matters there are some people incredible skills they can scratch at a million miles an hour the party is dead like you, <laughs> you know i want to see people break a sweat so specific just gonna like Bring the question on a little bit more, and um, just kind of like in terms of the developments of technology, um, has it enhanced the, the the art form, or has it hindered it, or is it a bit of both? I, I think it's absolutely. I think it's, it's helped it. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I love. I think I, sh I showed you earlier on. I love the fact that we can use the traditional skills of using a turntable. So you're kind of using like a kind of old versus new, or all meets new. Yeah. Type so of setup, I mean, yeah, yeah for the, for everyone, I I use Technics twelve tens. Um, Pioneer mixer with um, Serato DJ Pro and Phase, and for me as a DJ that plays out, it's really important that I can deliver the party to the dance floor. It has, I mean, I can't have anything go wrong. And I've been to, as, as I'm sure everybody in this room has, I've been to different venues where the the, the kit isn't up to standard. And the problem is everyone's always looking at the DJs. Is your the, the issue? So for me, my setup is foolproof for the things that I want to do, but also still gives me the ability to still flex in that hip hop DJ way with two turntables. So that to me is the yeah. the ultimate kind of cool. setup. And more jacks, obviously, you, you you spend a lot of time sort of hyping up stuff. Um, some watch some of your tutorials, and you're like literally taking a brand new piece of kit and. You're reviewing it, you're demystifying it, you know, you're kind of encouraging people to go out and buy some of this stuff as well. So, like, you know, uh, what, what do you see, you know, in terms of the development? Is it, is it a positive thing, presumably? A hundred percent. Like, today, we've got stems in software. I can make an acapella and an instrumental out of any record on the fly. Can I just ask, just for and those who not know, might not know what a stem is, do you want to just kind of elaborate? I can make an instrumental and an acapella out of any record yeah. on the fly. Like, yeah. that is it. I can make an isolated vocal and I can make an isolated instrument with no vocal on it just by pushing a button. Yeah. And in fact, I can break it down further. I can take the drums away, leave the bass, the melody, and the vocal. I can take the melody away and leave the bass and the drums. At... It's absolutely insane. And the quality is like good. It's not perfect, but it's just evolving really quickly. So the idea that DJs remix on the fly and so on, like that is going to a different level altogether. You can find that with cue points and everything else. So you can jump around in the track. You can loop sections of a track. And now, yeah, it's going to change. That's the, that's the level of technology we're at. So to say that like 100% DJ technology is ever elevating the art form because now you can rip records to bits in ways that 20, 30 years ago, DJs would only dream of being able to do it. But I do think there is an element also of less is more sometimes. So when you have less, you're going to like really pull out everything out of you to, to do the most you can with it. And I think, you know, that's something we also haven't touched on is there is an element of if you're someone who's come from an a, um, analog era, you know, you cut your teeth through an analog era of DJing, you know, you it's kind of like cheating where it's sort of like sync those records kind of thing where there's nothing wrong with that because like I say it's about rocking a party but you know there is also something I think good that comes from actually having to invest in learning a craft and a skill kind of thing it's not just like I'm dipping into this I don't really care I'll just press that space bar and then the, the computer is gonna do the rest and then I also think sometimes when you have so many options like that not everyone has the musical gift or ear to know how to do that correctly so some of it can end up being a bit of a car crash you know what i mean like and it's sort of like okay i actually liked what this incredible producer invested all these hours into making that record like that 
I didn't want to hear your random remix sort of thing, but the STEM, the technology is incredible what you can do. Like in the right hands, it is amazing. And it is wonderful that it gives access to more people to get involved and get creative as well. So just building on that and sort of kind of probably our penultimate question really is like AI, the future of uh, uh, everything, the thing that we're all sort of scared of. What 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 does that mean for DJing? Is it a dangerous thing? What threat do you think it poses? Can anybody future guess what might happen well it's a bit like t technology and you were talking about the sync button a minute ago uh, it's de-skilling um the people that have invested well it's, de it's making it a lot easier a lot more accessible for everyone to look like a certain type of dj when they haven't uh, necessarily the right to be that because the computer's doing it for them mm -hmm. so people have invested years in learning techniques and you know, honing their craft all of a sudden can be replicated by telling the computer to do it. And for me, that's just lazy. And I think if that's the way that we're going to go as society, that's just going to make us lazy. And I think it's important that we use our brains to study and we, we earn and learn our craft. Yeah. Cool. I think sometimes with AI, though, we, people say like, but yeah, then that will free people up to have time to do other things. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So in one way, that's like, a, as devil's advocate, like that's another way of of thinking about it too but no I, I i agree with you and maybe similarly we wasted way too much time like learning how to mix two pairs of vinyl and we could have been doing way more interesting stuff quicker if we just had the technology from the outset maybe i just go back to planting a seed it takes a hell of a lot of time for the tree to grow and the fruits to flow that's all i say about ai so quick it didn't even happen it ain't real so i, I don't care if ai because it doesn't I don't talk to AI, it talks to itself. I'm out here in the real world. What do they call it? IRL, in real life. <laughs> Joke things. It's all real life. So we'll end up on the last question, really. We've got some younger members in the audience. Oh, yeah. um, and thank you very much for everyone coming along tonight. But, you know, obviously, you know, here you are and why sometimes people tune into kind of panel discussions is because, you know, you are the heroes, you are the representatives of this particular scene, and there's people that maybe here are doing a bit of DJ, maybe they're just starting out early on in their career, maybe doing it as a hobby, and stuff like that, and I'm just going to ask you, like, why why, should, why bother being a DJ in the first place? What, what, what would be your life lessons now that you've been doing it for some time? Like, what, why would you encourage people to, to keep at it? Um, and we'll, we'll start with yourself first. Well, DJing Jackson. is incredibly fun. It's probably the most fun thing you could do. <laughs> like, I love DJing. I live for it. You know, I would never stop DJing. And Are you smiling, by the way? I, I love... No, I genuinely... Like, I love it with all my heart. But also, if you have a love for music and you want to share it with people, it's the best way to do it. Whether you do it on the radio, on the internet, on TV, in a club, in a bar, in a house party, it's about sharing music that you love with other people and that's a wonderful thing, and it will always be a wonderful thing, whatever format it is, whatever situation it is, that's it. And so, yeah, DJing is the greatest thing. If you want to get into it, get into it, because it is it's a blessing to us all. Okay, and Sam, Simon? <laughs> I'm not sure I can add to that. <laughs> <laughs> it is an absolute blessing. It's so amazing. And I still get as excited today to hear new music that inspires me. And there's so much new stuff that's coming all the time. And then to be able to take that and then to play it to other people. So they go, wow, what is that? And you see people shazamming. And it's great to still have the opportunity for me to travel around uh, to different cities, meet different people, go to different record shops, play music. And yeah, it's just, it's just gr it's a great life. It's a great life. <laughs> and maybe have a couple too many drinks from time to time. Sarah? Um, my dad always said to me, you know, doing a job that bring, brings joy to other people's lives, what can be better than that? You know, and that's in whatever field you work in. So for me, that's how I feel very uh, privileged to have been able to have a career as a DJ. Okay. Just a connection with music, you know, the whole point of DJing for me is purely to listen to music. I don't even care to play to other people sometimes. I'm playing records because I like music, and, and that's why people should be playing it. It's not a career, it's not a money making thing, it's not a business thing. It's, it's like a life hobby. You love music so much that you want to play it to others, you want to share it with others. And often I go to places, and people say, Normski, when are you playing? I say, I'm not. And they say, Why not, man? Because I'm not. I don't care who's DJing, I just care that the music's good. 
I've never cared who was on. In fact, I don't even know why people watch the DJ, especially looking at your friend you're dancing with. <laughs> That's why it's like about hip hop though. The DJ does a demo, you watch him. As soon as he finishes his demo, you watch the B Boys. As soon as he finishes their demo, you listen to the microphone check. Then you look at each other and go, right, which one should we do? I don't know, man. I'll do some graffiti. It's a community. <laughs> Sharing is caring, and that's why DJing is so important. What a lovely way to end this panel discussion this afternoon. And thank you very much for everyone who's tuning in on the radio, for those people inside of the studio. Let's give a round of applause for our amazing panel today. Hey. On the panel, we have Mojax of DJ Perspivics. Sarah Love and Normski have been Donald Jenkins. This has been a discussion about DJ and the lost art form. And I think we've worked it out that it's well worth listening to. So let's keep it hip hop. This is the bridge four, and we're about to move on to something else. Uh, yes, in. yes. We're going to keep things rolling. We're talking about DJs. I'm going to introduce the next.